uh, and hopefully you're here to uh, talk and learn about the variety of uh, research service, research data services and analysis and computational services that we have um, here at UNM um, across, and I'll be talking a little bit more about what we mean by um, the research life cycle and how it relates to um, life cycle thinking around research data. Um, and we're going to start out with a presentation from John, who's going to um, uh, talk a bit about open data. Um, I'm going to then talk about um, our uh, research data services and the support we provide um, in terms of planning for, executing, and ultimately preserving and sharing research data throughout the life of a project and beyond. And then, be in that. Yeah, <laughs> Matt and Patrick are going to talk about the computing support. I wasn't sure how you guys were going to tag team. Uh, I'll, I'll start briefly, and then Matthew will you know, do the heavy lifting. There you go. That's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> so, but to, to, to start out, um, I'm going to briefly talk about why we're actually here explicitly talking about research data management, because many researchers, um, whether even early career or well-established, already have some degree of understanding that they've developed through their research process and how to manage their data in support of research. But I need to talk a little bit about some of the, the um, changing landscape around research data that is increasing the importance for explicit consideration of our data. Um, as, as we can see, yeah, then we'll talk about open access and open data the life cycles, our support, and then, um, then the support that CARSI provides as well. So when we're thinking about the drivers that are pushing us towards um, more explicit thinking about research data, data management, analysis, and integration of our analysis with um, strategies for efficient um, data creation and collection, documentation, analysis, visualization, um, collaboration around that data, these are some of the key drivers that keep coming up in our conversations with researchers. Number one is um, as we're working with larger data sets and larger collaboration teams, um, by having an explicit strategy for management of data throughout the entire research life cycle, actually gives us a lot more efficiency, which allows us to ultimately generate greater impact in the research that we're doing. We're spending less time wrangling the bits, we hope, more time actually doing the, doing the research. Um, so efficiency certainly is a big plus. But we also have some other drivers, whether it's coming from the um, sponsoring agencies, as now for um, almost nine years, we're looking at a set of requirements from the National Science Foundation and the other, especially the federal uh, research sponsor agencies. But as those requirements have gone in through the federal sponsors, there are also a fair number of private organizations, uh, foundations and other funders of research that have followed that example uh, in terms of having requirements for explicit written data management plans taking what may have historically been an implicit strategy for managing data for a project, forcing researchers to actually make that explicit through the submission of a document as a part of the proposal that is being uh, submitted. Though the reality is that, you know, in, for example, in the context of a two-page National Science Foundation data management plan, there's an incredible amount of information that is needed to go into those plans that is necessarily presented at such a high level that it's not necessarily actionable from your perspective as a researcher. You can think of it as just a distillation of what is hopefully a more complete and comprehensive data management plan that you have for your project when you actually start. Um, but you can think of it as the distillation of that, that larger plan. So we definitely have that requirement. We also have the increasing requirements from publishers for the data that are associated with the papers that are being submitted for review and publication, the public accessibility of the data associated with those papers. 
And that requirement, which, com which complements the requirements for public access to research data by the sponsors, brings in a whole lot of additional considerations in terms of how your data are structured, how they're documented, um, how you have taken into account potential restrictions on the appropriateness of sharing particular, particular data, whether they're privacy, you know, personally identifiable information, confidentiality, related to patents. There are a number of things that you also potentially have to take into account while also trying to meet these public access requirements. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things to be thinking about, but there's this parallel requirement in terms of public access to data associated with publications that requires us to get to the point where we can publicly share our data and hopefully do so in a way where we're not embarrassed. <laughs> um, and, then, and then again, this, uh, this increase in collaborative research where we're not necessarily working in small research teams anymore where we could you know, swap a USB drive between our, our lab mates or have a little shared computer in the corner of our, our office that our in-room collaborators have shared access to. We're working across larger teams, multidisciplinary teams, where we don't all necessarily have the same shared knowledge of the data that are being collected or used. That even then has increased uh, documentation requirements and ways of organizing and structuring the information. Um, if we aren't explicitly planning for how we're going to organize our data, how we're going to structure our data, how we're going to document our data, even during the life of the project, when working with these large collaboration teams, we're going to, inc we're going to you know, be working against that efficiency uh, scale. And we may actually have introduced some inefficiencies in our process, so we may not even be able to do the work that we're proposing to do, as we spend so much time looking for the data we need for an analysis, or swapping versions of data that may be not in sync with each other between, between collaborators on a project. So these are all a part of the overall goal to think more explicitly about how we're going to manage our data and then executing that, that, that plan throughout the life of the project and ultimately transition the data products coming out of that project into a long-term preservation and sharing system so that we don't just meet even the me immediate public access requirements from our publishers or sponsors or, or our disciplinary colleagues, but we're able to do so in a way that those data will be available in the long run in a very planned and well-executed fashion. So yeah, we need to do this to be able to get the money. We need to do this to be able to do the, get our publications. And as a part of this publication process, we're continuing to work on the treatment of research data as first class research products. So in the long run, and this is still something we're working towards, being able to um, be able to have uh, citable data objects that themselves are demonstrating their value and contributing to the ongoing uh, uh, productivity of the research enterprise. So we talk about publications require, or the, the supporting data required for publications, but this is also a scenario in which we're able to publish data as first class um, data objects themselves that can be downloaded, reused, and cited independent of the research publication that you may have written that was based upon those data. So it, in many respects can increase the citation surface, the opportunities for citation of your work beyond the sort of standard publications that we're talking about. And then the collaboration question. So I'll hand it over to John, and he'll talk some about open access and open data. So what I'm going to talk about is kind of like an openness interlude in sort of the overall framework of lifecycle data management and support services that we provide here on a, at UNM through the libraries and through CARSI. And the reason we want to take a few minutes to step out and focus explicitly on openness is because making your research products open whether it's an open access article or an open data set, uh, it can feel like an unfunded mandate, right? Like this is something that is sort of tangential to my research purpose, it's sort of tangential to my research goal. NSF is expecting it, UNM is expecting it. How do we go about meeting these requirements in a way that really facilitates our research instead of hinders our research? And 
what I want to do is kind of give a little bit of background about how we got to where we are in terms of the expectations around open access and open data. And from here on, I'm probably just going to use open access to refer to articles as well as data. Uh, how we got there and sort of how we approach it within research data services in the libraries when we're working with researchers to make data open. Uh, so, you know, how much data should be open and how open should it be are sort of some questions that we come to when we think about it as we're thinking about these and, and providing these services. Um, and what resources do we have to make available to researchers so that, again, to the extent that this does feel like an unfunded mandate, we can sort of lower the threshold and lower the barrier to getting meeting these expectations and getting your research products out there in an openly accessible way. So the expectation about making research products openly accessible and openly available uh, has been gaining momentum for a long time, right? So one of the earliest open data sharing or, or data sharing statements came from the NIH in 2003. Their statement on sharing research data. With their statement in 2003 and the NSF data sharing policy in 2007, if you look at these things, it's like 50 words. It's like somebody has sat down and said, we need just to get a statement out there without worrying about how we're going to operationalize it or make it something that, that the researchers can, can really get guidance from. But to give you an idea, Whereas they had a very high level generalized statement in 2003, the NIH now uh, this week released for public comment uh, their statement on more explicit data sharing uh, and making data processes and resources for, for making data publicly accessible and open, right? So it's something that's still underway. The NSF famously had their data management plan requirement went into place in 2011, and although this timeline continues beyond 2013, one reason I got up to this point and stopped at the OSTP <coughs> memo of 2013, and the OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology <coughs> Policy from the White House, releases a lot of memo, but for us in the library field, this is the memo. It came out in February of 2013, expanding public access to the results of federally funded research. And essentially what this did was it mandated that any research body that receives over a certain amount of, of public research funds, which was something like 500 million, so that includes the NSF and all of NSF's grantees, is, was required to develop a plan in order to make the products of federally funded research, and that's publications as well as data to make it publicly accessible in a way that facilitates public access, metadata mining, as efficiently and easy as possible for the public, right? So it's no longer an aspect where it's going to be sufficient to say in your data management plan, we're going to have a project website and the data is going to live on my computer and interested colleagues can email me for it because your interested colleagues in your field are not necessarily considered part of that broader public group who are now expected to have some access to the research products that you're creating. Mm -hmm. And part of this mandate that came out through this memo was all of the, the, the sponsoring organizations in the government that have over $500 million R&D in their budget had to come up with a public access plan. And it took some time. But NSF's public access plan came out in 2014, 2015, and basically it lays out in a much more explicit fashion than in the highly generalized data sharing policy and the still generalized data management plan requirement, really lays out in, in more explicit detail what it means and how you can go about making your data publicly accessible. Uh, and lastly, and so, you know, everyone, we talk about these things in terms of carrots and sticks, right? And this is the stick, right? But if you look in the grant proposal guide, it explicitly says that data sharing and the data management plan is one of the broader <coughs> impacts. So as you think about how you're crafting the broader impact statement for your proposal, as you're thinking about moving from one project to the next project, and how can you demonstrate the impact that your project had, the NSF very much considers the sharing of these research products to be a broader impact. So now we get to the carrot the benefits of openness, right? And a lot of this is altruistic, um, but it does come down into like real numbers. And so for example, there is a demonstrated, and this is one of my research areas and I won't go too far into it, but there is a demonstrated open access citation advantage. 
where if you make an article publicly available through open access, it actually will result in a higher number of citations. Um, it also democratizes access to information. So one of the reasons I wanted to show the slide is this is the all-time downloads of an article that Carl and I published in 2015 that I put into our UNM's digital repository. And although I didn't put the numbers here, I can tell you it's been downloaded way more times. The open access copy has been downloaded way more times than the publisher's copy. I think the publisher's copy has been downloaded like 50 times, right? And here we can see, you know, 66 times just in Eastern Europe. But it also, and this is also demonstrated and documented in the literature in, in, in the sort of the open access research, it democratizes access to information where people in developing nations and in developing economies are able to have access to the data and to the articles that they can't otherwise get because in their institutions and in their countries they cannot afford to access paywalled content, right? Um, right. So other practical benefits include increased transparency, right? Uh, putting your data out there, putting your research products out there to get more eyes on it uh, can help improve your own efficiency, as Carl mentioned a, a moment ago. It reduces the duplication of effort, uh, and it creates the opportunity for interdisciplinary application of your research and your data, right? Now, to come to this, this slide is one article since I posted it probably in 2016. <coughs> this is all of the content in the UNM Digital Repository, their downloads in the past, well, during September 2019, so not the past month, but in one month. And again, we can see democratizing the access, but also making the content available to the public and interested people uh, globally, whether they're in developing economies or not. And you know, the one thing I would go back to that single paper map. Um, in the traditional model of, you know, send me an email or call me and I'll send you a copy of my data or I'll send you a copy of the paper. That's a lot of phone calls and emails. Uh, um, one of the other significant advantages of getting your data or preprint copies uh, into a repository is that you've essentially offloaded that demand of you needing to answer those phone calls, you needing to respond to those emails. Instead, you don't have to worry about the, um, you know, keeping track of where that PDF is or keeping track of where that collection of data files is as you maybe go from one computer to the next to the next to the next over a matter of decades, potentially. Instead, once you're successful in getting your content into one of these repositories, that's now their, their responsibility. And by the way, that's what they're designed to do. Their contents are managed to exactly provide that long-term discovery and access. So it's something you don't have to worry about, and it's something that um, is not going to be an ongoing responsibility that you have in the long run. Right, and to, to move but just ahead a little bit, um, and we'll come back to this in a moment, but not only does it increase your efficiency where you no longer have to maintain that website, if the graduate student who built the website leaves, you don't have to worry about what's gonna happen to the website. These data public publications that get published through a data repository can be assigned a DOI. And it, that DOI, it's, it's certainly possible to say, if you download data from my website, please be sure to cite it, right? A person may cite it, but the, the citation trackers, and as I said a minute ago, part of the, the carrot motivation here is to be able to demonstrate increased impact for your research. The, the companies like Crossref and, and Web of Science that are monitoring citations and tracking citation data are probably not including your website mm -hmm. among the resources that, that they count. However, if there is a DOI on the data set that you publish in a data repository, that very much does get counted by Crossref, it very much does get counted by Web of Science. And so not only have you made your life easier in terms of making your content available in a way where you don't have to maintain it, but you've also made your life easier in terms of demonstrating the impact of your research because now in a system like this, you can get a DOI and we can assign DOIs to the content we put in our local repository. Uh, that becomes uh, evidence of impact, right? Your citations will be tracked and monitored by these citation services. 
So I said a minute ago, unfunded mandate, lots of trouble. We've talked about why we might do this, both the carrot and the stick. But coming back to this question of how open do I need to be, right? And how much data should I make open? Part of what we will work with researchers to do is identify what are the shareable products of your research project. You may have human subjects research, right? It's really not appropriate to say, and the NSF accepts this, right? You can say, I have human subjects research that we cannot make publicly available. However, you still have an expectation to make something available. We all know that human subjects research, when it is presented in a summarized aggregate form, is no longer sensitive. Right? And so we work with researchers to find ways that they can have products that can be publicly shared uh, in a way that significantly represents their research. Uh, we can identify best fit repositories. We have a repository that we manage here. It's maybe not the best place for your data. Right? Uh, for example, and I'll show you the, the, the next slide in a moment, uh, we can host statistical economic data, uh, but there are purpose-built repositories that other researchers outside of UNM are going to to find data. And so we work with researchers to get their, their data and their articles uh, into repositories that are going to maximize the discoverability among their colleagues and other experts in the field. Once that's done, there may be a need to curate, to uh, work with the data a little bit to improve the documentation, uh, maybe change file formats. A uh, little bit of virus checking, again, these are things that are good when you're publishing data, but not necessarily something that researchers are expert in, and that's what we're the experts in, and that's what we're here to help do. And publish that data with a DOI, if appropriate, into an appropriate repository that's going to maximize your access and discoverability. And once that's done, we can also help get reports and assess the impact of the data that you've made publicly available. And so what this is, the reason I wanted to share this, I think this is my last slide. Those two slides I showed before with the global counts, that stuff is in the UNM digital repository, which we maintain and we support. Uh, I had a researcher who had economics data. Our repository is not the best place for it. The ICPSR is a very good place for the kind of demographic and economical and statistical information that he was publishing. So he sent us a CSV file and a DO file, right? And what we did with him was we worked with him to read his research paper and develop extensive documentation, variable level documentation, about what that data set is and how it was processed. And as you can see, it's been viewed 536 times, downloaded 16 times. It's been associated with one publication, which that was part of the record where it was the publication that he wrote that actually used this data. But again, I don't think it would have gotten this much attention if we put it in our digital repository. Right? So what we, one of the things we do consider is what can be made open and how can we make it open and accessible in a way that's going to maximize the benefit to you, the researchers. And so that was the openness interview. <laughs> so I might build on the, 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 what John was just saying in terms of the citability and being able to get credit where credit is due in terms of being able to track the potential impact of data sets that you shared. Um, I have a, a, a common uh, data intensive publication and associated data set that I use when I'm doing graduate student data management training. And I use that to illustrate um, the potential impact that you can have by having a strong um, data sharing and publication and access uh, component to an associated publication. When I recently went through a refresh on that workshop content, I was looking at the citation statistics. This is for a 2013 paper by a research team at the University of Maryland. As they were doing this in partnership with Google, they were uh, analyzing uh, forest change at a high resolution over the entire planet between two, the early 2000s and 2013, 2012. Um, that entire underlying data set, and it's continued to 2018, is available for download from the, um, the co-locate, the, basically the hosted web application that Google has provided through their partnership. They have very detailed documentation about the data set. And the remarkable thing is that 
Um, if you look at that article in Web of Science, the article has been cited nearly 3,000 times in the time since its publication in 2013. And the Web of Science Data Citation Index, zero in terms of the number of times the data set associated with that uh, publication ha has been cited. Um, there are at least six papers or six data sets in the um, in data site, one of the other uh, large scale sort of data citation aggregation and reporting systems that are clearly based on the data from that paper. Um, and they are sharing the data sets that they use in their analyses. And those are getting cited because of, and there are those citations are being tracked because of the DOIs associated with those. And the persistent cite, and the citations including those DOIs. Since, while you know, it's highly functional, the Google-hosted website for this collection of data is not at all being captured in terms of use and the impact of that data set. Though I personally know at least a half dozen researchers who have used those data in their research and publications. And even if they were cited using the recommended citation by the, <laughs> by the authors that is pointing to this website, that's not something that the folks that are accumulating these data citations are typically going to find. So you're not going to get the credit that you deserve for the impact of the data that you're sharing if it's on, even if it's on a large scale website hosted in a, uh, in a place where even somebody puts it, cites it, you may still not get credit for it. So that, you know, being able to close the loop on getting your data into a repository where you can get a permanent identifier that's going to be tracked and aggregated by these citation systems is a significant benefit to you. Because otherwise, you know, you may be having an impact that's unmeasured and that you can't make a case for, say you're going up for promotion or tenure, or you're wanting to uh, make a case for, um, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, salary boost. <laughs> Something like that. If you don't have the statistics, you can't make the case. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the research and data life cycles and then about our research data services. So something that you're probably already very familiar with is a variation, one or other variation on the research life cycle in terms of you know, generating ideas, identifying collaborators that you can work with on a particular project. Um, Developing a proposal um, and, you know, that brings, brings your ideas and collaborators together, going through the research process itself, and then publishing your results. Where, of course, here we're talking about publication both of traditional papers and the associated data. And then if we dig a little bit more deeply into that research process, this is especially where we're working most intensively with the data. But as we'll see in a moment, um, it's not the only place where in our, our approach to data has an impact. But as we're going through that simulation, observation, measurement um, process, and we're managing the outputs of that, we're going through our analyses, we're sharing the data within our research team, those are all activities that we go through every day as we're going through our research projects. And all of those have an impact on how we're managing data. And this, those of us that work in the data space we have sort of this alternative perspective on the world that's very data-centric. We think about the phases that data go through in their life cycle as we think about how we're going to design and conceptualize a particular data problem. What types of data are going to be collected? What formats? How much? All of those things that we need to be thinking about. We're then you know, thinking about what processes are, are going to be in place for creating and integrating those data into some sort of data management process and system. We have this idea of appraisal, ongoing assessment of the data that are going through this process to figure out which data get kept, which data get thrown away, you know, those intermediate values that aren't particularly relevant. We don't need them cluttering up our systems. So making decisions about what is kept, what is disposed of. Bringing those in, in a data sense, um, integrating the data we're going to keep into some sort of preservation system in a data management and analysis process this is analogous to how we're going to store those data for collaboration with our research team um, 
The access, use, and reuse is generic in the data life cycle, but that's absolutely where we're doing our analysis. That, and then this transformation, you know, for us in a preservation context, means that in the long run, we're able to maintain the usability of those data through time as potentially uh, supported file formats change. Or the use to make the data more usable, they may be transformed into other uh, alternative formats for use by particular user groups. But this data life cycle has a lot of parallels with the research life cycle. And this is where this crosswalk that we've been using for a number of years for trying to communicate this has come from. Where we have on the left side that research life cycle and across the top the, life, the data life cycle. And the primary point out of this is as we go through these various phases of our research process, what are the things that we should be thinking about explicitly when it comes to our research data? And I'm not going to go through this point by point, but what I really want to emphasize here is that at, even when you're just in those early phases of conceptualizing your work, explicit thinking about the data, the types of data, working with existing data that you might have to explore the ideas that you're working on is an important part of the overall research process. And of course, by the time we get down to proposal writing, there's a lot of thinking we should be doing about the data that we will be using as a part of our research project. So at a high level, these are sort of the large scale uh, areas to be thinking about the aspects of our data management throughout our research process and the different dimensions of our data management strategy that we should be uh, bringing into the mix. The, the phase where we're essentially in a planning mode, developing a proposal, or if we're, we're not working on a sponsored project, just what is our plan for managing the data? What is our research project plan? And then the actual execution of our research project itself. The other message here is that even if you don't have to provide a written data management plan to a sponsor agency, go through a data management planning activity anyway, because that is going to give you those benefits of efficiency, being able to more effectively meet those publisher demands um, for data sharing, being able to more effectively share your, your data during the course of the project with the rest of your team, being able to anticipate what your analytic needs will be around those data so that you're in a better position to be able to get more quickly to the analysis as opposed to having to constantly feel like you're you know trying to race through molasses to actually get to that fun part of the research which is actually doing the analysis you're wanting to do. So this is a way just to think about and integrate thinking about the data into how we're thinking about the rest of our research project. When we're talking about our research data services program, these are the areas in which we probably provide the most direct services, but we also provide guidance and support through the rest of the data life cycle. But often when people think about and what people come to us for are questions around their planning process and support in developing their data management plans. Um, assistance in transitioning their data and associated documentation into a preservation system and a public access system when appropriate, um, ongoing access to storage of the data both during the life of the project and beyond. These are probably the most common areas, but it's, the, it's certainly our services and support are not limited to those areas, but those are the most frequent areas where folks are asking for support from us. So now, digging just a little bit more deeply um, as we think about our support services, on the preparation space, um, we certainly have a lot of support during the project development and planning project process. Um, this project conception and plan. This is again getting back to even if you're not working on a specific proposal or responding to a particular sponsor requirement for a written data management plan, we are enthusiastically supportive of talking with you about how to develop a plan for managing your data throughout your entire research project and beyond, um, regardless of whether or not you have to distill that down into a plan to present to somebody else. 
Um, we can help identify appropriate partners. And, you know, that's where, you know, our, our close work with Carsey and other resources on campus come in, where being able to identify the collaborators and resources that would benefit your project comes in. Writing that data management plan, if it's required by a sponsor, is certainly a, a core uh, capability. Talking about budget and helping to think about what the costs might be associated with your data management for your project. We provide some and support some inventory or uh, some uh, infrastructure here on campus. Um, we are aware of other data management, data storage, data analysis resources on campus and off. And so we can help identify where there may be some potential costs that you want to think about adding to your budget. Um, and then, of course, the support, as John was talking about, in terms of being able to conceptualize and characterize what those broader impacts might be as you're writing your proposal or just thinking about how to tell the story of your research project that you're developing. So once you're actually in the project mode itself, this is where we can think of that project execution in, in three phases. And this is somewhat aligned to the way we handle new projects, especially sponsored projects, when they land on campus. There's the initial uh, startup for a project in which you know, we're doing all the logistics for getting a project started that's associated with the funding, getting people hired, getting equipment purchased, getting you know, all, of that, all of those things. When we're talking about the research data support that we can provide, the first thing is actually revisiting that data management plan. Making sure that everyone is on the same page and that things haven't possibly changed over the course of the time when the proposal was written and when the project is actually starting. Maybe the collaborators have shifted a little bit. Maybe the nature of the data that are going to be used has changed. Bottom line, this is the opportunity to say, okay, this was our plan. Is it still valid? Let's make sure that we are now getting in contact with all the folks, all the partners in the project that are going to help us manage, analyze, preserve, share those data so that everybody's on, you know, knowing that something is ha setting up. This is where we're also setting up all those capabilities to make sure the project is able to move forward as expeditiously as possible and we don't end up with any speed humps along the way. And then this is also where, as a part of executing that data management plan, we set up our schedule for how we can periodically revisit and track how well we're doing in actually achieving the objectives of that plan. When we're sort of in the ongoing activity of the project, we certainly want to keep tracking progress towards what the data management plan had, had said, or being able to identify where we're deviating and seeing whether that is out of necessity or whether, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of things drifting. As it's like, oh, I forgot, yeah, we were supposed to be sharing these data, but they're just piling up on my hard drive. Maybe we should, you know, get that, get that into our process. Um, working in helping to support the documentation of those data products and getting those into the preservation and sharing system so that you're ultimately able to report on the, uh, the essentially moving towards those obligations that our sponsor agencies are increasingly interested in. It's still sort of at a program by program level in the National Science Foundation in terms of the individual program officers paying more or less attention to what is, what is actually happening in projects relative to the stated plan and the data products that are coming out. But we're absolutely continuing to head in the direction of more stringent evaluation at an ongoing basis of our projects in meeting these objectives in terms of public access to the data that are being produced by our products. Being able to actually um, point to the DOIs, the, the shared locations, or being able to talk about the inventory of data that have gone into a preservation system can get you in the position so you can answer those sponsor questions uh, easily. Then finally, there's essentially the end of the project. You know, I talked about the benefits of being able to get your data into a repository so that you don't have an ongoing, you know, upfront responsibility for answering those phone calls and email messages. Um, this is one of the things, you know, and our experience has been that this is pretty common. When you get to the end of a research project, 
you're often really ready to move on. You know? <laughs> the last thing you want to be doing is having to do a lot of heavy lifting in terms of reformatting, documenting, uh, transitioning, answering those phone calls and emails. You'd ideally want to get that all done and out of your hair so you can move on to the next interesting problem. So as a part of the closeout, finalizing that inventory of products and where they are and how they can be accessed so that you can um, get, you know, make sure that they're in the appropriate preservation of public access systems. Um, and then, uh, then do the final reports for our sponsors so that we can demonstrate to them where that, all that content is. That's also an important reference for us as we're writing our next proposal, as we're answering that question for um, the outputs or outcomes of previously sponsored research. If you've got that previous report that has the inventory of the 43 data sets that you put into our preservation system, 39 of which went into a public access repository because it was appropriate to do so, that makes it very easy for you to include that information in that next proposal as part of the outputs of that previously sponsored research. So then you're being able to tick the box on, I graduated this many students, we had this number of publications, these are the data sets that came out of the project. Those are all important metrics to, you know, in this case the National Science Foundation, as that's a particular requirement they have, for demonstrating that they got their money's worth out of their previous investment in your research project, and they're likely to get their money's worth again. So these are uh, some of the key resources for certainly reaching our services under RDS. Generically, you can just send an email to rds at unm.edu, or you can reach John or me uh, independently through those emails. We also have a research guide here at libguides.unm.edu slash data, where a lot of, there are a lot of uh, sort of points of entry for the requirements from sponsors, the support services we provide, contact information for us. We have our digital repository and our recently added uh, data repository called Dryad, where uh, we can automatically get a DOI associated with data sets that are deposited into that system, streamlining the process, and also getting the data into a system that is better aligned for capturing statistic and use of research data, as opposed to the more general purpose repository that our digital repository is. But that's part of the conversation we can have in terms of which products you're generating may be better for the digital repository versus our data repository versus other repositories where it may be more appropriate in your discipline, it may be more appropriate in the nature of the data, but that's part of the consultation that we do. Um, and then finally, uh, CARSI that Patrick and Matthew will be talking about next. Um, as Carl said, we do a lot of work together in terms of handling data sets, working with data, and, um, and in many cases, researchers use us sort of that in the conduct experiments and analysis phase of the life cycle that Carl was talking about. So you, know, you, you have your data, you're trying to conduct experiments, analyze your data, model your results. That's where the, a lot of what we do comes in. And that's because computation is basically ubiquitous in most areas of modern research. So 20 or 30 years ago, people said, well, computational modeling, well, that was something physicists did, or mechanical engineers, or aerospace engineers. Um, you know, when can we think, and Matthew will have some examples to show there, but more and more, these are examples of research projects that people are using CARSI facilities to do. People are doing, you know, research computing just from all across the space, ranging from designing materials to, you know, genetics to you know, text databases to smart sensors to environmental data. And it sort of spans the gamut of humanities and arts and sciences and social sciences and engineering. And so you know, using, using these resources, getting the support to use these resources well is key to a lot of modern research. And that's something that's very hard to do, right? So it's easy to say, I have my laptop, I can analyze a little bit of data here. But when your research problem outgrows what you can do on a laptop or a desktop, um, doing so effectively is something that's, that's, uh, that's very challenging. And so UNM, uh, through CARSI, provides a lot of support for sophisticated computing-based research. So this includes traditional high-performance computing in computational science work. So fluid dynamics, quantum chemistry, you know, molecular dynamics, 
um, has sort of been the part and parcel of high performance computing since the foundations of uh, you know, computational science. But more and more that includes things like large scale data driven research. Right? So we've gotten a large data set, image databases, text databases, social media feeds, Twitter feeds. We want to do interesting analyses on those data sets to look for things, to study the structure of the graph of social media uh, feeds or to look at huge core five text and look for interesting features of that, or to look at terabyte or tens of terabytes of medical imaging data and seeing interesting things. And then finally, one that, that, uh, that Carsey's always focused on a lot and I think is really interesting is what people call sort of the long tail of research computing. So when you think about sort of the distribution of research computing, everybody thinks about in these first two areas what Amazon is doing, or what a national lab is doing with fluid dynamics, right? And that's sort of the, the big high profile, all these people doing the same thing again and again on different data sets and different problems, but using similar techniques. But there's this huge range of the rest of research that happens out in the tail that where every project is unique in its own interesting way. And that's in many cases where new research starts, where we have a new research approach, we have a new idea that no one has ever done before, we want to work here, and so this is often non-traditional areas in arts and humanities and the social sciences where there aren't these 30-year, you 40-year know, year histories of existing mature code bases to work from. You need a lot of significant support to get off the ground and do research there. Right? So you can use Excel on your laptop to get started for the first you know, few weeks or months or years, but at some point, Hopefully, your, pro your research, your problem outgrows what Excel on a laptop will support, and you need something larger. And that's something that we've been working as a center to support. Uh, Susan Atlas, the previous director, acquired the, the Xena supercomputer, which was built to support that. We've been doing more and more in that space as well. Um, in terms of that, we provide a lot of different resources. So, you know, the, I think when people think about a supercomputing center, we think of the computers, and so, of course, we have the obligatory picture of the computers here that we use. Um, and we do provide thousands of cores and terabytes of storage and you know, large amounts of RAM for people to be able to do their research, um, whether that's here or whether that's at national supercomputing centers at which we can help you run, or whether that's on, you know, on, on, your, on other systems as well. The, you know, so we can provide the specialized machines, the general computing systems. We have those, we run a data center. It's, it's part of the job uh, with its own challenges. But the real thing I want to highlight, and which Matthew will talk a lot more about in the rest of this talk, is the staff support for this. And so I think what really sets Carsey apart from just, hey, by the way, we have big computers, good luck, right, is that we have a team of faculty and staff and students whose job it is to help researchers get started doing research. So if you can come and say, I have this research problem I need to do, you know, here's my data, or here's the computational problem I'm trying to model. They're not the experts in your problem, but they might be able to help you find a place to start. Right? Here's a kind of analysis someone has done similar to this. Here's a piece of code someone could use. Or if you have a piece of code that's, you know, okay, here's what I can do on my laptop. How do I make that work on a data set that is two orders of magnitude larger and needs to run for six weeks to get my analysis done? That's where our staff and our students come in to help you learn to use and use effectively use the resources that we have. Um, and we support a wide range of research projects here. And I'll let Matthew pick it up here since Matthew leads user support um, and a lot of these efforts that I just uh, just mentioned in person. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm going to go back one slide and say that's it's exactly right. So we provide hardware and we provide lots of support on the software, installing software, making sure it runs correctly, configuring it for these large machines. And we also provide the expertise to guide not only how does your software work, how does it work with the interface, with the hardware interface, but how do similar research projects we've seen in their life cycle really work. So we can actually guide individual projects, hopefully from start at CARSI to some publication or grant proposal, whatever your final research goal is. The whole life cycle you can be there for you. Um, Carsey has a huge variety of different projects. I think we're pretty excited that we cover a, a large part of what UNM does at Carsey. Um, cosmology, neurology, archaeology, forestry, there are hundreds of projects 
of all different types. And I'm sure whatever project you're working on, um, I'm just looking for the art history project, but I'm, but I'm really hopeful that will come soon. Um, we can support what you're doing. And since we see so many different kinds of high performance computing projects, um, there's some similarities that, that come out. Um, so exactly as Patrick said, we normally see users when they've got a great project going on their laptop or desktop, and they can't make that next step to um, a larger data set. And they come to us, they ask for help, and we can put them on the large machines that we have. Um, so figuring out how to adapt the software that they already have and familiar with so that it works on these large clusters is really one thing that really is common to many of these projects. How, because what happens, the, ne the next step is the researchers realize, oh my gosh, I really have this huge resource I didn't know I could use before. And they start running, instead of a couple of simulations or analyses on their laptop, they're running hundreds or thousands of simultaneous experiments. And that has its own set of input and output challenges that we also have expertise in, in managing. Um, matching the right hardware to the right research sessions. We have a variety of machines at CARC. We have general purpose clusters with thousands of CPUs. We also have, to handle the long tail of research, specialized machines with GPUs, large um, main memory systems for particular kinds of problems. So we figure out how do we match the right hardware to the right research question that you have? And if we don't have the right hardware to address your problem, we can aid you in setting up budgets for your grants to add that capability. We also see um, communities forming at CARC around particular hardware sometimes, but more commonly around particular software solutions. And this is really important, I think, for reproducibility. So often we have new graduate students who maybe haven't used a particular tool before, they're just getting started, and we can connect them to a larger research community who has experience with how is this tool being used in the past for publication, what are the standard practices for using that particular software tool. And it really helps them get into a larger community and not feel so isolated when, some, when a PI hands them a tool and says, hey, go do the research using this tool. These are all things that we are dedicated and have experience with helping people manage. I think the best way to give an insight into how CARSI operates is to go through a couple of examples of um, projects over the last year at CARSI, just again to emphasize the diversity of what we do. This is Manish um, Batari uh, from ECD. And his project was to help fi uh, firefighters um, navigate basically in smoke-filled rooms. So they're blinded, they have these infrared goggles they wear, but interpreting the signals coming from these infrared goggles is really difficult. So what Manish did is he used the Xena cluster that Patrick mentioned, um, that has dedicated machine learning hardware. He used that cluster to train an AI to interpret those, those video signals. And it actually labels, in, um, in real time it labels inside of goggles, where the doors are, where a person might be, what are the exits, it even does path planning. So if a firefighter has to leave a room, but again is blinded by smoke, it can navigate the way out of that room. And this got quite a bit of community attention and is now being um, uh, used by the Santa Fe Fire Department. So this is machine learning. Um, wind farm modeling, Sunny Lee from mechanical engineering, has been using car C to simulate how airflow happens over um, the, the, the wings, basically, of these propellers, and how we can improve the efficiency of those turbines. And he's publishing this work um, in the next couple of weeks. Volcano monitoring. Um, this is a, a project I'm pretty close to, and I'm familiar with how Carsey has really been able to help this project. Uh, that is Tiverva Volcano in um, Papua New Guinea, and it's emitting vast amounts of carbon dioxide. Less than half volcanoes out there have been studied, and so what our John Erickson and Tobias Fisher are doing is designing swarms of drones that actually fly into these um, plumes, sample the CO2 gas, and can measure the flux for two reasons. One is you can actually predict eruptions by looking at the CO2 flux, and secondly, no one knows quite how this contributes to 
The win for them at car seat was they're trying to design these fault-tolerant drone algorithms, which means they've written these sophisticated uh, simulations that, of course, they can run many, many instances of at car seat. But John is telling me, more importantly, reproducibility. Because he's not running on a laptop or a desktop, he has a dedicated machine, a dedicated environment that just does this. So he sets up his experiments, it runs for 24 hours, he comes back and looks at the results, but he has a consistent computational pipeline in that environment. So he can always come back exactly the same environment that he used before, and he's able to control how these experiments go. Quantum computation and quantum supremacy has been in the news recently. Um, this is a project um, by Ivan Deutsch and Manuel Munoz doing statistical analysis of quantum spin gates. So this is trying to understand how you can create quantum computers and control them. And the legend says, the same characteristics that make quantum computers exponentially powerful makes them exponentially hard to model. So you really need large systems, really large systems, to explore and define how these quantum gates work. So we worked with Ivan's graduate students, meeting every week, for an hour or two to get his R code parallelized, working, and able to solve this problem. <coughs> it's more than just fast computation. Um, as we alluded to earlier, the Office of the Medical Investigator has vast databases. They're one of the largest databases of medical Im images in the country. So 15,000 people with 15,000 images each is a very large data set. It's more than they were able to handle. They were able to come to Carsey and we have set up storage for them and ways of accessing um, that data. And things like specialized network access. So Jed Crandall in the computer science department uh, spends part of his research mapping the Great Firewall in China. And you might not be surprised to hear that he comes under pretty frequent attack. So his network is somewhat isolated from the rest of UNAM's network. And we can find that kind of tailored So we have dedicated faculty, staff, and students to help researchers. We also offer frequent introduction to car seat workshops. So this is to sort of onboard um, a bunch of people at a time who are interested in doing work at car seat. And we also offer workshops to support various courses that take advantage of car seat. So this semester alone, we had three courses that students were doing their homework and their projects on car seat resources. So I taught um, individual workshops for standard computing, molecular structure theory, and computer vision to support those courses. So it sort of keeps the professor from having to worry about how do I teach CARSI to my students. We provide that service. And I have open office hours every week where I'll meet with individuals or appointments outside those times to really get into the nitty gritty of what is your research question and how can we get it addressed at for a second about um, access to car seat. So traditionally, it's been you know, SSH terminal login. This is what most of our users do. But in more incre increasingly, um, things like MATLAB integration and JupyterHub integration are really important. <coughs> and these provide a graphical, friendly way of interacting with the large compute resources we have on the back end from your desktop. So you can just go to the website or start up your MATLAB client and get a, the advantage of these specialized machines. Let me just do a quick example of some of the benefits of something like Parallel MATLAB. And Carsey is the only place that has Parallel MATLAB installed at UMM. So basically, simply log into your MATLAB client like you normally would, develop your code, and seamlessly you're able to connect the back end to Carsey and have the actual code run there and return the results back to your desktop. So it really is designed to lower the barrier, barrier of entry, where you run exactly the same code you've been running all around, but now you can do much, much larger um, problem sets. So here's an example where we're doing a spring ODE, a parameter sweep over, the, over um, this equation. With one worker, perhaps on your laptop, it takes about 173 minutes. 
even with 16 or 32 workers that you could run at Carsey, and really you can run up to about 400 of these workers at Carsey. You can see we're already down to about a minute. So this doesn't just mean that you are done quicker, it means you can do much more in the same time. Right? These were a much larger parameter space. And I think it's important to recognize that this is no longer a luxury, this is expected. Reviewers looking at papers are, are now saying, okay, you looked at a dozen different parameters, why didn't you go to the HPC center and look at a much larger set? So this is becoming expected rather than a luxury. Another example with um, GPUs, <coughs> so this is not just using lots more um, CPUs, but using a dedicated machine like Xena to solve the problem. So this is the Wave PDE. So the blue line here is how long it took on a CPU, the green line is how long it took on a GPU. This is a log scale, so you can see there's a vast improvement just by using that GPU on Xena. This is Jupyter Hub. So Jupyter Hub is great because you can just open up a, a, a web browser, go to one of our clusters, and here I've logged in, I can see all my files and graphical interface. The power of Jupyter Hub notebooks is that um, they let you create literate uh, documents that have code in them. And this is shareable, and there's lots of nice little things like I can add uh, sliders and play around with the, how this plot looks. So it's really interesting. <coughs> but the nice thing is that Carsey, because Jupyter Notebooks you can run on your own machine, is tied in <coughs> to the thousands of cores that can solve these kinds of problems, especially for machine learning. So you'll be able to solve much, much larger problems, but in a nice, contained, shareable document like close by talking about um, graduate student internships. I think this really captures Carson's approach to interfacing with the rest of the university. So we support graduate students every semester. Um, our goals are, first of all, of course, to train them in advanced research computing. But also, we get from them a sense of what's happening in their home departments. What is it their fields care about? What directions are they going so we can prepare for that? We can say, oh, you know, this particular genomics pipeline seems to be popular, according to our graduate students, we can aim towards that direction in the future. And also, those graduate students, when they learn these um, advanced research computing techniques, can go back to their home departments and spread the word, right? If someone has a problem in their department, one of our graduates can help them solve that problem, or at least explain to them where to go to find the solution. So the biggest area of growth we've seen over the past few years is in biology. So psychology is starting to uh, get active as well, and you can have some archaeology projects. And so our three graduate students this semester have all been um, computational biologists. This is Aurora Krauss um, in Arlene uh, Salinas' lab. She studies neuroimmunology, which means that she does a lot of uh, genomic analysis for things like stag beetles and zebrafish in order to figure out how, what are the relationships here. And she runs those genomic tools at Carsey. Scott Lippard, um, so does Hantavars. This is actually a vampire bat that he's holding here. He was in Costa Rica uh, last month doing field work. And this is a, a great example. So he goes out, gathers DNA samples from these vampire bats, which apparently sometimes can be rabid, which is rabid vampire bite that you wouldn't notice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> brings that data back and then processes it on the large machines at Carsey so that he can get the results that he wants to publish. Uh, Scott was so excited about this, he actually added a computer science master's degree to his program. And Vanessa Sergeia, so she's um, coming from computer science, and she's studying how do we scale up immunology models to the HPC systems, to these large clusters that we can provide. So in her work, um, she looks at flu infection in the lung. Uh, the previous state of the art was looking at 1 26,000th of the lung in simulations. Using our very large three terabyte RAM machines, she's able to get up to full size human lungs, which of course is a much more compelling simulation than of just a very small part. So I have business cards here. Um, I'm hoping you'll take one if you're interested in working um, for running a project at Carsey. 
and I can lead you through the process of creating an account and a, pro and a project and get you started. And I think we're going to have a discussion session now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have any questions people have? Or? Yeah.